Good evening and a very warm welcome to the first online international conference to the Cyprus Sustainable Tourism Initiative under the auspices of the Deputy Ministry of Tourism of the Republic of Cyprus. Global sustainable tourism. It's so much more than a nice catchphrase. The understanding of pro-sustainable behavior and its true economic implications is an important subject for tourism destination marketers and policymakers. So what is done now in companies, educating customers, collaborating with vendors, supporting communities while empowering and diversifying staff can all contribute to making a positive difference for people, destinations and the planet for years to come. While the uh, pandemic has shut down communities and people have struggled to survive, we also see that the planet did quite a bit better. Wildlife thrived, air quality improved worldwide, so much so that the Himalayas were seen for the first time in 30 years in India. The host of this evening's conference is the CSTI, the Cyprus Sustainable Tourism Initiative, an independent organization established in 2006 to promote the development of sustainable tourism in Cyprus. It's my pleasure this evening as moderator to hand over to the chairman of CSTI, Mr. Filipos Drushodis, for his opening welcome. I would like to welcome you to our first online international uh, conference. Your virtual presence here with us today give us strength to continue our efforts towards making our world a better place. In the light of the pandemic, we have chosen to give the conference the title Sustainable Future. In every crisis, there is an opportunity. It is crucial that travel and tourists has the chance to restart more sustainably and more responsibly. Symbolically, we have chosen to address this topic on the eve of Earth Day. From March tourists, we ended up having no tourists at all. The tourist industry will never be the same, and everybody knows this. It will be beneficial to see the opportunity in this situation and start thinking about post-coronavirus era, the new era in our industry. Many economies depend on tourists, and we need to address the industry's comeback in order to mitigate the negative economic and social impacts that resulted due to the COVID-19. Coronavirus should give us hope that we are able to tackle the climate crisis. The, fo the focus now needs to be on how to learn from COVID-19 crisis in order to address climate crisis. It is crucial to all stakeholders to tackle climate change with the same energy, the same energy that the pandemic is being addressed. The high profile online international conference that we are organizing today is seeking to convey a strong message that tourists will resume. This is, it is a necessity, but needs to be more responsible. It is the time to introduce changes in order to reduce environmental impact and at the same time address the climate change. We need to secure the destinations to, in, to, en to be enjoyed for future generations for the locals and the tourists alike. In order to understand the, the consequences of the pandemic, we need to understand the dynamic connections of the tourist industry that plays into the economies. And tourists add values to every step of the way. And as a person from the tourist industry, I will use the word invisible from our keynote speaker, there are invisible benefits from tourists. We become happier, better, tolerant. We appreciate others more. We appreciate other cultures. We, we were introduced to new flavors. We create memories and experiences. We improve our health and it, it usually breaks our daily routines. It expands our horizons. So tourists is good for everyone. And to understand the, the, the volume of tourists or the impact of tourists and why tourists matters, just one out of 10 jobs relate to tourists and 10% of the world domestic, gross domestic product is also due to tourist activities. So, and as per the predictions of the World Tourist Organization, we were expected to have 1. billion people by the year 2030. This ended up to having over tourists just before we we having this pandemic. Over tourists creates a lot of problems, and there is serious problems to sustainable development, 
We need to create destination management organizations. We need to be able to understand that the income per night does not increase when the numbers of tourists increases. And we need to improve our product and to introduce destination management systems. And as the reports from the WTO, only 11% of the national tourist organizations address sustainability globally. And we hope that Cyprus is one of the part of this 11%. Uh, and as you can see on the picture on the left, you see Venice is a, an example of over tourists in before COVID-19 with 24 million tourists that per year in a small city of 55,000 residents ended up that the residents leave the city. And as you can see from the photo on the right, after COVID-19, we see that we have clear canal and clear atmosphere. So as a person from the tourist industry, I very much believe that tourists helps us achieve the 17 sustainable development goals. And with no tourists that will have difficulty achieving these 17 sustainable development goals. And as Edward Norton mentioned, development that is not sustainable is not, in fact, development is short-term loan against a long-term debt to the future. And it is an opportunity to seek right approach to tourists through sustainability. And we have different forms of sustainable tourists, such as alternative tourists, experiential tourists, authentic tourists and others. We need to look forward. We need sustainable future and to see it as an opportunity to change and improve. We want the governments to tackle the climate change the same way they tackle the pandemic. When we start again, we do not need to base on unlimited growth and unlimited consumption. We need the tourist industry to reduce its environmental impacts. And of course, we are expected to see different behavior from the tourists and the tourist industry needs to adjust to this. Fewer tourists, less growth need for sustainability. It will have positive impacts on the societal dimension, on the environmental dimension and the destination's economy. A destination cannot, can have tourists, but tourists should not have destination as Doug Lansky mentioned. We want the destination to create products more authentic, more original, focusing on the people and the culture, create experiences for the guests to cherish for the rest of their lives. As I see it, it's a great opportunity to change and start seeing tourists not as numbers with dollar sign on the head, but as our guests who will welcome into our homes and whose visit will be an experience for both the host and the guest. The Secretary General of WTO correctly put it that tourism is a lifesaver for millions of people, especially in the developing world. Reopening the world of, to tourists will save jobs, protect livelihoods, allow our sector to continue its vi vital role in promoting sustainable development. Tourism is resilient. It's as resilient as the olive trees you see on the slide. Tourism is a necessity and not a luxury product, and we must give tourists the recognition it deserves. I would like to take a few moments from your time just to say some of the highlights of our organization and some of the projects, and I will be done very shortly. Uh, we were established in 2006 and we have been affiliated with the Travel Foundation. We have a, a, partner, a destination partnership in 2010 with, until 2015 with the then Cyprus Tourist Organization and the Travel Foundation promoting sustainable tourism in the island of Cyprus. Uh, we have started our cooperation with the Prince Albert Foundation in 2016. We have signed a five-year memorandum with the University of Nicosia uh, in 2019. And here we are celebrating 15 years of existence, having organized this first online international conference, Sustainable Future. In every crisis, there is an opportunity. And we hope that uh, we'll, we'll, everybody will benefit from this uh, first online international conference. Some of our projects that we're currently working, we're very proud and are very proud to have uh, Thomas with us tonight and also Helen Marano from the Travel Foundation and Thomas from Tree Care Foundation. We're working on a Kibaro Sun and Sea Plastic Free project, which is an initiative of the Tree Care Foundation delivered by the Travel Foundation in partnership with the, our organization, CSTI. We are working also on domognostics and project a high technology project, reduce hidden energy costs in the hotel industry without compromising the comfort of our guests. We are very proud to have two beyond plastic met 
projects with the Prince Alfred Foundation, as you can see from this photo, in this day of cleaning the sea and the beach, we managed to collect more than 1.5 tons of, of litter, mainly plastic and other, other waste as well. And we're also very proud to have a project with, the plastic, with IUCN, Plastic Waste Free Islands Med Project, which is a project to reduce the plastic leakage from the first two islands tested in the Mediterranean, one being Cyprus and the other one is Menorca. And we are also working very closely with the University of Nicosia to develop the first sustainable park here in Nicosia, together with the municipality of Engomi. We are the first organization to be uh, signatories of the uh, Global Tourist Plastic Initiative, which tries to promote, to reduce the causes of plastic pollution. And we are very proud to have a, a young girl, because we live in youth as well, Marilena Macri, which is our youth ambassador, she shares our vision of a plastic-free Mediterranean and help us convey the important message. Ma Marilena has secured a place in the Tokyo Olympics in the coming uh, uh, summer. And of course, in every presentation, we feel obliged to thank the people that help us make this uh, event organized today. I would like to, to thank the people from the board of CSTI. You can see our team there is a, a, a big group of people. I'd like to thank our team at the Cyprus Sustainable Tourist Initiative that work very hard these days. I would like to thank, special thank to the University of Nicosia and the students of the conference and exhibitors course of the Department of the Hotel Tourist Sports Management and the lecturer Jan Orfanidou from the university and the university events team that helped us organize this event. This is you guys, the panelists, our distinguished panelists, our distinguished keynote speaker and our moderator, Saskia, as well. Hopefully, we're looking forward to hear with you and to, uh, to, be, to, to be informed as well. We'd like to thank the Deputy Ministry of Tourism for being, uh, putting this event under its auspices and their support they're giving us. We'd like to thank the academic partner of, of this event, the, of, of the CSTI Nicosia, University of Nicosia. These are our sponsors. I will not go through them. Uh, and the media sponsors as well. We also organize with the youth of the, with the college students sustainability through the lens of youth, a photo competition, and they will, will be sharing with you the, the winners of this event. Last alone, we can do so little, together we can do so much. And together in the CSTI team spirit, we stand. And we are very thankful that we have you from all over the world here with us today. Uh, thank you very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, that we are meeting here today on the eve of Earth Day, discussing the sustainable future and how to restore our Earth and what lessons we have learned from this pandemic, it's a good moment to reflect on some of the insights we have gathered already. First of all, we know that 70% of all emerging diseases such as Ebola, Zika, and almost all known pandemics, such as influenza, HIV AIDS, COVID-19, are zoonoses. That means they are caused by microbes of animal origin. Second of all, we know that while pandemics have their origin in the diverse microbes carried by animal reservoirs, that their emergence is entirely driven by human activities. It is estimated that there are some 1.7 million undiscovered viruses existing in mammal and avian hosts. Out of these, it is estimated that 540,000 up to 850,000 could have the ability to infect humans. Pandemics are nothing new, but what concerns us is the rapidly increasing risk of pandemics, with more than five new diseases emerging in people every year any one of which has the potential to spread and become a pandemic. So far, we aim with preparedness strategies to control diseases after they emerge. The consequences of this approach are now very visible and everybody's exposed to them. An escape from the pandemic era requires policy options that foster transformative change towards preventing pandemics. And as the underlying causes of pandemics are the same global environmental changes that drive biodiversity loss and climate change, this means that opting for sustainability 
is no longer a cost, but an absolutely needed investment into the resilience of the tourism sector and our societies. I congratulate the Cyprus Sustainable Tourism Initiative, which is an early signatory of the Global Tourism Plastics Initiative, for convening you here today. And I wish that this meeting stimulates your thinking and contributes to this needed transformation. Thank you. Before we continue, a little about the format for this evening, before crossing over to the United States, to the keynote speaker, Mrs. Megan Epler-Wood. Conferences rely on support and collaboration. And for this, the Cyprus Sustainable Tourism Initiative is grateful to its academic partner, the University of Nicosia. Its main sponsors, Eurobank and the Cyprus Perfumery Theme Park, with further support from Tui Amusement, Hermes Airports, Hagiorkis Flower Museum, and media sponsors Cyprus Mail, Kathy Merini, and the Cyprus Broadcasting Corporation. Following Mrs. Megan Epler Wood's presentation titled Sustainable Tourism in a Post-COVID-19 World, Mandates for Destinations of the Future, we will have a panel discussion with six leading figures in the tourism sector. Mr. Savas Perdios, Deputy Minister of Tourism in Cyprus. Mrs. Angela Gerego, President of the Greek National Tourism Organization. Mrs. Helen Marano, Chair of the Board of Trustees for the Travel Foundation. Mr. Thomas Ellerbeck, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the TUI Care Foundation. And Mr. Gary Wilson, CEO of EasyJet Holidays, as well as Mr. Fabrizio Orlando, the Global Industry Relations Associate Director for TripAdvisor. You too can be part of the discussion. Please put your questions and comments for the panel. And for ease, if you can let us know uh, from for whom the question is addressed to the panel, it will help us an awful lot. So without further ado, a very warm welcome uh, to all who've joined this evening. It's great to have you with us. We've got um, a large number of people uh, online with us for what I'm sure is going to be an absolutely scintillating discussion. This is Megan Epler-Wood, president and founder of Epler-Wood International. Over to you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And I'm uh, really looking forward to this dialogue. I, I take great pleasure in giving an introductory talk, uh, but I do hope that we work together to come up with some new scintillating results. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the introduction and thank you to the CSTI for inviting me. So um, I want to get you thinking about transformation. Uh, I think uh, we all know that we're working in a pivotal moment and that we need to take this opportunity to rethink how we rebuild. So before we even start, I want you to take a pause. I want you to think for a moment as we all need to do that we need to reorient ourselves a bit because of all of the dramatic changes we've experienced from going to the most rapidly growing uh, sector of the global economy for quite a long time to being the most dramatically affected by the pandemic. So this type of change, you know, we had the world in our hands in a way because we are the travel industry, right? So we have tremendous knowledge of global scenarios. And here's a chance, if there ever was one, to pause and think how we can change how we are affecting this beautiful planet of ours. And if we do, this will foster a lot of creativity. And I'm sure many of you have noticed uh, innovation is in the air. And the reason for that is, is because we see the need for this type of regeneration. Uh, John Elkington calls it, you know, a green swan moment. He's the author of the triple bottom line concept. And he believes that those who grab this moment will change in a way that's not only beneficial for their businesses, but also for the planet. So the invisible burden of tourism uh, I was the lead author of in a real team effort that was funded by the Travel Foundation. And uh, we also worked with Cornell uh, 
Johnson's College of Business. So we took a, a, a what I would call a very practical approach uh, to how destination management may need to change. And we started with a round table, just a little bit smaller than this, of course, and then went from there to documenting what is unmeasured in the tourism ecosystem. And we found that there's a lot, a, a great deal, like much more than we would want. So what we concluded is that, in fact, because of the unmeasured uh, ecosystem of tourism that is basically our industry uh, interaction with communities and natural areas and uses of vital resources, right? It was all those vital resources that weren't being measured by way of exactly how tourism was affecting them. And so what we learned, in fact, is that that was a significant drain on destination resources. And that measurement was in no way, in no way connected to national tourism management processes. So, of course, I'm just giving you a brief summary of the document. It's freely available on the Travel Foundation website. But I, if I had to give you just one slide, this is it. Um, in fact, each tourist is not only generating economic impact, which we do measure very well, uh, it's generating economic deficits in certain areas. And those deficits have never been measured. Okay, and so as a result, what's happened since this document came out, which was in 2019, is more and more local authorities have expressed a lot of interest in this because they need to know this in order to plan their infrastructure. So what we're thinking now, that was 2019, that was the pinnacle of uh, over tourism. And then of course, this dramatic rethink is now happening. Uh, but Certainly, if I can leave you with anything, I believe the decisions we make right now could drive renewal for generations. So I also wanted to say that one of the critical elements is to have a, in your case, an NGO that is monitoring and planning tourism. This is not so common. They've played a pretty long-term role for you, and I can see the number of accomplishments they have had, as we all saw. I think that process, whether it's within the NGO world or partially in private business or partially in government, is something that has to be decided. But let's take the big picture now for you policymakers. I think most of you would say that you have to have a set of objectives and you have to look at, say, the invisible burden from the point of view of how does that fit into your objectives and goals for the future. Everything okay? Yeah. Um, so it's very important now, and of course, most places have done this, such as Cyprus, you have your plan. And, and in the case of Cyprus, they've driven that plan towards some very, very good goals, such as more sustainability in product development and improving distribution of tourists into rural areas. Those are excellent goals. So that's where I imagine all of you are starting from that kind of plan. So what I'm going to talk about now is how you might want to augment that plan in the future. So what would that take? What we know now is that new management is required to retain the value of destinations and that that management platform, which is really undecided, you know, it's, it's undecided at this time, would need to gather data in order to help manage the invisible burden, meet those SDG goals that we all are committed to, and pivotally lower GHG emissions. So what do we measure? How do we do that? There's been some good conversations about this for many, many years, as we know. But just basically, when I first started working at Harvard and doing my book uh, on uh, sustainable tourism on a finite planet, I presented at Harvard. And this was one of my slides. And um, that was at the Harvard Museum. I wanted people to understand, well, what are our requirements? Um, and I would say, these are our fundamental requirements for measurement. And our, our overall approach to that will have to be routine. It can't be a special project. It can't be a temporary grant uh, because from here forward, we have to do this regularly. Okay, and I want to call out a really great project that does exist in this category in your region, the Interreg Mediterranean Mito Med Plus. And if I got that right, I hope. And um, I 
had the opportunity to have the their executive director um, on a panel that we did at Harvard and and then we did review this material and it is very close to what we're talking about they have sustainable tourism indicators ready for your region that are designed to, to inform you as you move forward so that's a real we can certainly talk about that more in the discussion so I now want to tell you about uh, the study that I did while I was managing uh, this uh, program at Harvard that was to provide local authorities is what we were looking at with science based data. Uh, so that we could look at the stresses and strains for destinations and look at how to measure that for them so. I'm only going to give you two slides on this. Uh, it's a report that we can post for you, uh, as well as another report I'm going to mention uh, in the chat. But what comes out is what we measured is in this pie chart. And we did it on Jerba Island in Tunisia with support from GIZ. And we have the results. And these are the areas of stress and strain. The bigger the part of the pie chart, the more stress that is. And then if you look at the tourist per day, similar to many other results, we found that obviously a tourist is emitting more carbon than your average resident. So these are things that we know. But the question we wanted to answer is, could that be measured relatively easily and regularly? And what we found was yes. And so we decided to call this the heat, uh, the holistic environmental uh, sustainable tourism tool. And here was another part of it, which is to look at not just your utilities or your transportation, but your natural resources. And I wanted to mention this result for you because it has to do with high density coastal tourism development. Now, Gerbo had laws in place for this to prevent too many hard structures along the coast. But it is well known that once those hard structures go in, the dunes begin to recede. And we did find that in Jerba, and they were seeing dune recession on the island that was very notable. And that, of course, will be something that has to be measured in future in your region. I want you to understand these basic principles, because if you don't, this, this relates to the survival of your infrastructure. Okay. So on the infrastructure note, uh, there's something else that we all have to be uh, accounting for and understanding how we're going to pay for, and that is renewable energy. Uh, I think we would all agree, and I look forward to the discussion, how are we gonna pay for that? Will that be you know, part of something that tourism does not need to deal with? But I would say the more tourism dependent the region is, the more tourism should be part of the national plan for renewable energy, and that can be a terrific discussion. Overall, I can say this, um, your regions will vary exactly what they need, but our model suggests that you need to look at what your infrastructure, especially your sustainable infrastructure needs to look like in 10 or 20 years. If you allow that to degrade, or if you don't make that transition, be it business or small or large business will probably suffer from that. And we already know that there are problems with energy waste management in the region. I have plenty of case studies. So it's something that has to be delivered on at this point. So the question is, well, how do we do that? In addition to, of course, this question of how do we make sure our cultural monuments have adequate investment to make them work properly as tourism grows back. And then finally, we, of course, have to spread these benefits and make sure that small business and local entrepreneurs are gaining, and then ultimately that our infrastructure is climate friendly. So I leave you with, I hope, a different way of thinking about this. I want you to really think, is this the way to approach sustainable tourism? You know, well, we have the business, you know, Cornell College of Business in, involved in this. And, you know, granted, there could be other opinions. But we certainly think that this would be highly valuable to many regions of the world, including your region. And so what will you get out of that? an improved value added destination environment that's protecting its cultural assets. You also get climate resilience. And you look to be sure that, for example, we found that local people were not being served for things like waste management or sewage treatment equally 
of course, with the tourism environment. That, that's something that if you can deliver on this next round of infrastructure is going to be very popular politically, all right? And then finally, uh, these platforms have to be designed to work with the existing system. And what we have found, and this is another report we've done at Harvard uh, recently based on a round table in the fall, that the reality is that we will have to redesign our governance system to account for the invisible burden and use data-driven analysis to do that so that we have, I mean, let's face it, tourism isn't all retreats into, you know, beautiful natural areas. Uh, that's why we chose this slide, <laughs> because we want to remind everyone we're a massive industry and we have to take that into account as we move forward. So ultimately, okay, I was asked for some action plan concepts and here they are. Um, we have to actually be able to measure this part of our tourism economy and be sure that we are investing in it. We do need local capacity to do this. It doesn't exist now. And I just want to mention that Cornell and Eplerwood International and the Travel Foundation are working on that. Uh, we have a project with UNWTO that's being finalized to create a sustainable destination management certificate. So we're very excited that's in process with full announcement coming in the fall. And then finally, uh, in terms of goals with regional finance institutions, I speak with uh, especially my ministers and my business executives here. I want you to really speak about this. I hope you will make comment. How much will business benefit from this approach? And then if you think it does, which if you don't, I want to hear, um, then also uh, sustainable finance strategies is a whole new way of approaching how we make tourism sustainable in places like Cyprus. So if we take this path, if we, or take a path uh, that looks at how to drive innovation into our sustainable tourism economy, we will see regeneration. This is a beautiful picture of a sustainable tourism destination in Asia. Um, and it is meant to express that we can do it. We can make our tourism destinations more resilient in this era. We can make sure that they are in balance with their environment and that local people are not just getting, say, jobs. That's not as, I mean, yes, of course, we want jobs, but it's much more than jobs. It's a well-being that is defined by things like sustainable infrastructure. So I hope we can all see that that future is possible. So thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Uh, my contact info is here, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Uh, Megan Epler Wood, for a most interesting and insightful presentation. We're looking forward to the panel discussion to go over some of the very salient points uh, that you've actually made. Um, the Cyprus Sustainable Tourism Organization has a superb collaboration with the Prince Albert II Foundation, created in 2006 by Prince Albert II of Monaco, and which concentrates on environmental protection, sustainable development, climate change, and the promotion of renewable energies, as well as biodiversity. The Mediterranean basis is a natural priority due to the geographical location of uh, the principality. And so they are keen to take uh, action with the players concerned. We're delighted to have received this very warm uh, message from His Serene Highness Albert II, Sovereign Prince of Monaco. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, despite the difficult context we are currently facing, it is important that this conference takes place. Therefore, I would like to congratulate you for organizing it. The issue of sustainable tourism should be of concern to us today more than ever before. This may seem paradoxical at a time when tourists are markedly absent and when the tourist industry is going through its worst crisis in history. Although the virus is still having a severe impact on our society, we can see that life will soon get back to normal. We know how much our contemporaries, frustrated by long months of restrictions and lockdowns, are eager to get back to traveling and for many of them to rediscover the sweet pleasures offered by the Mediterranean. And we know that entire sectors of the economy are dependent on the return of tourism and are anxious to accelerate things. 
It is very likely, therefore, that the next few months will see an explosion in what some are already calling revenge travel, a sort of frenzied tourism which may cause us to lose sight of certain priorities. I'm, of course, thinking of environmental protection, and in particular of our Mediterranean Sea. For many years now, we have identified some of the consequences of tourism on pollution and degradation of the most fragile ecosystems. And for years, solutions have been put forward and developed so that travel, which is a source of discovery and well-being, is not synonymous with destruction. The Cyprus Sustainable Tourism Initiative is contributing to this necessary work. That is why I'm delighted to be supporting its action by taking part in this conference as I did a few years ago when you made a commitment to BMED, Beyond Plastic Med, which promotes initiatives to combat plastic pollution in the Mediterranean. Initiatives such as BMED respond to ever-growing public expectations. Our contemporaries are now paying more attention to the consequences of their lifestyles. They are aware just how fragile our planet is, the Mediterranean in particular. They hope that their children will be able to enjoy these incredible landscapes one day. And they are keen, through their choices, their habits and their consumption patterns to contribute towards what is one of the greatest challenges of this century, the implementation of a more responsible and more sustainable development paradigm. In this respect, I think that tourism can be a vehicle for awareness, a unique lever for action. This is why I believe that all the conditions are met today to recommend bold solutions involving not only the players in the tourism industry and tourists themselves, but also governments and environmental NGOs who need to work together on this common objective. This is an economic objective through the development of new offers of the tourist industry, an ecological objective through the promotion of more responsible practices, and a human objective through the invention of new models and new leisure activities meeting the deepest desires of all those who love our sea. I know that the solutions which are being developed here and discussed today will help us reach this objective. This is why I was keen to send you this message of support, encouragement, and confidence. Thank you. I'd also like uh, for those people who've just uh, maybe uh, been able to log on to the conference just to uh, once again reintroduce uh, introduce our panel, uh, Mr. Savas Berrios, Deputy Minister of Tourism in Cyprus, Mrs. Angela Gerego, President of the Greek National Tourism Organization, Mrs. Helen Marano, Chair of the Board of Trustees for the Travel Foundation, Mr. Thomas Elebeck, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the TUI Care Foundation, Mr. Gary Wilson, CEO of EasyJet Holidays, and Mr. Fabrizio Orlando, the Global Industry Relations Associate Director for TripAdvisor. Uh, a very warm welcome to you all. Thank you again for being here. And I'd like to begin this evening's uh, discussion uh, with you, Mr. Savas Berdios, Deputy Minister of Tourism in Cyprus. And the million dollar question is, is Cyprus ready? The challenges are huge for opening the industry. And it's clear that uh, previous models of mass tourism are just not sustainable. What are your thoughts? Do we need government reorganization? Hi, uh, Ms. Kostandinu. Hi, everybody. Oh, uh, please call me Saskia. <laughs> call me Saskia. Uh, well. Okay. Um, a very big thank you um, to all of you for the invitation. Um, very big thank you to uh, all the other panelists, obviously, Ms. Wood for uh, the keynote. And uh, yeah, this is a very, very important subject. Uh, one which is very close to my heart personally, but uh, um, everybody here at the Ministry of Tourism. Uh, to answer your question, uh, Saskia, uh, if we're ready, uh, yes, uh, we're ready for the reopening in 2021, but uh, uh, for me, that's not enough. Uh, we're not only here to talk about uh, how to reopen a destination in the middle of a pandemic. We also have to keep an eye on the future and uh, realize that uh, no tourism is never going to be the same again. Um, as a ministry, we launched uh, a new national tourism strategy uh, last year in January that was... Uh, just before the pandemic, actually. Um, and um, as uh, strange as it may sound, a lot of the things that the pandemic has taught us were already included in that uh, national tourism strategy. I will read a few uh, uh, things that uh, we included in there. Um, what the pandemic has shown is that we need to move even faster than uh, what was necessary beforehand. 
And um, for those who have not read um, maybe the foreword or the strategy, our vision is pretty simple. I think all destinations have the same vision to um, sustainably develop our tourism industry in a way that is uh, beneficial to um, the community, uh, the environment, um, and also, of course, um, to um, people who live here and uh, who are trying to make a living from tourism. Now, uh, with our, our strategy is based on five pillars, obviously, turning uh, the island into a year-round destination, um, making it um, a destination which uh, has a, uh, an even better product, giving uh, tourism to everybody um, uh, at the destination, meaning spreading it to several parts of the island, uh, making uh, the island a climate-friendly destination, obviously, and this is what we're going to be talking about today, uh, but also a digitally smart destination. And uh, the thing I want you to remember is that uh, we uh, are not here simply to promote the destination. This is what DMCs or uh, uh, destinations in the past, this is what they used to do to promote the destination. We're here to also manage it so that future residents and visitors can enjoy it too. Um, and uh, this is very, very important. And uh, I'm very happy to say that Cyprus right now is in the process of implementing uh, its own destination management system for the first time ever. Um, I will give you more information on that later on. But uh, only last week we have commissioned a study uh, which uh, is based on two uh, pillars, the environment. So it's an environmental study of our national tourism strategy and it's also a study of the carrying capacity of the destination. We need to start having these discussions. Uh, we need to start um, implementing KPIs in the national tourism strategy so that um, we can follow them up on a yearly basis leading up to creating a climate-friendly destination in Cyprus um, up to 2030. Um, now, within this uh, study, we're touching subjects that are very, very sensitive that haven't been touched before. For example, uh, testing the acceptance of tourism by the local community. Everybody's taking for granted that everybody wants tourism in their neighborhood. Maybe some neighborhoods don't want tourism. We need to know that. So we'll be focused on finding out these answers. In terms of the carrying capacity, we will be uh, looking at the carrying capacity of the destination as a whole, but also each region separately. Uh, and by carrying capacity, I don't only mean that in, uh, with respect to infrastructure or land availability, but also uh, visually and uh, with re regards to noise pollution as well, because that is also a carrying capacity. If the only thing you can see at night is uh, lights from the cities, that's also a pollutant, you know? Um, the other thing that we're interested in finding out, it has a lot to do with what Ms. Wood said about uh, the invisible burden of tourism, the cost of tourism. Obviously, tourism gives a lot to our island, but uh, it takes something away as well. We wanna know what that is. How can you know what policies to implement to mitigate uh, the damage? if you don't know what the actual cost is. And uh, finally, uh, we um, are planning on um, finding out exactly what the net effect of tourism on our GDP is. Uh, latest statistics from WTTC say that um, tourism uh, brings around 20% to our GDP, but uh, around 7% is lost because as a country, we buy a lot from abroad. So it's a shame to be losing that 7% and we need to be uh, implementing policies uh, across many, many ministries so that this revenue that visitors from abroad are giving us, uh, a lot of it is actually going to be staying in the destination. Anyway, I don't want to say uh, much more right now, Saskia. That was just a brief introduction. We can talk uh, about much more as we go along.
Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Berdios. You've made some very uh, salient points, which, um, as you say, I'd like to uh, come back to. I just want to go around the panel so that everyone has a, an opportunity just to uh, have a few words. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Angela Gerego, uh, President of the Greek National Tourism Organization, I'd like to ask uh, you, with the added challenge of being a large tourist destination from the perspective of having so many islands as well, what do you believe are the greatest challenges in meeting a sustainable tourism model post-COVID? Maybe I can come back. Do we have Mrs. Gregor? Mrs. Marano, uh, maybe you'd like to, uh, until we can manage to connect with Mrs. Gregor, tell us the chair of the board of the trustees for the uh, Travel Foundation, um, the foundation also takes an academic stance um, on the impact of tourism. How does collating evidence-based results actually help the industry? And how are measurements and statistics taken to measure sustainability? Thank you. Um, first of all, I, I want to thank you for uh, including the Travel Foundation and me in representing the whole organization and efforts and team. Um, I think that uh, certainly the Travel Foundation is uh, based on uh, working with evidence-based policy-driven decision-making. And in- um, Actually configuring forward. the kinds of measures that you're asking about is very reflective in the invisible burden, in which, which is why we embarked on this kind of a study with Megan Epler Wood and and also with Cornell University, it was critical for us to look at what is the risk of tourism and do a better balance and looking at. And so as we move forward into this new era of travel and tourism, having now learned how to appreciate it more with residents seeing what it's like not to have it, both the positive and the negative, and also for economies experiencing a new kind of vision of travel and tourism's contribution to national economies as well as local, that now we have a voice and a way to consider how do we do this as Megan was laying out in her uh, speech earlier, do it with good measures and holistic measures. And it's a lot of it is being, a lot of people are talking the talk one of the things that's valuable about the Travel Foundation is we walk the talk. And that is the part we need to be delivering what we're asking people to think about. But we also have to reach the consumer in the same level of consideration as the residents. I love that the minister, deputy minister, has brought out looking at the resident's perspective and do they even want tourism? Because really at the end of the day, why do we want tourism? And we have to be able to measure both the benefits and the negatives and make sure that the residents as hosts bring us to their home as international tourists, as well as expanding in the domestic arena, which may not be as relevant on an island destination, but certainly in the United States is critical that we know that we have to be able to do it slowly, considerately, and most of all, with the passion of being able to respect both the culture, the environment, and the needs of that community. Thank you. Um, Mr. Thomas Ellebeck, uh, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the TUI Care Foundation, uh, your strategic plan for uh, the past three years involved um, the plan caring for a better world. How has COVID-19 now impacted the direction that you're going to take? Or will you be on the same path? Well, I think the overall, thank you very much for inviting uh, um, to Care Foundation and myself. And I'm really happy to share the thoughts with, with the colleagues um, in, this, in this panel today. Uh, I think it's very exciting and, and we have seen so much so much initiatives from Cyprus in the last year, from the ministry, from the minister um, on sustainability. And uh, as uh, Savas Perio said before, uh, I think it's, it's really core of the uh, Cyprus uh, uh, tourism strategy, what I see over the last uh, years uh, in, the, in the work of, of 
the Cyprus uh, government, but also the Cyprus um, um, tourism in, uh, industry and, and associations. Uh, when you look uh, in this crisis and, and, and with the lens of the crisis, I would see, say uh, the most important uh, topic we now uh, realize the the impact of tourism for a number of countries in the world for for small um, uh, less income countries small income countries um, there is there are countries without any any national goods without any production like most of the countries in in in, in Europe um, uh, no um, so it's it's really that you can see uh, no tourist means for a lot of countries in the world. It's really not easy how to survive, and that's uh, uh, I would say when we are talking about um, tourism, and I think also the minister has done in his speech, it's always social responsibility, it's social sustainability, it's uh, economic sustainability, and it's ecological sustainability. And I think we we probably have seen, especially in this in this uh, Corona crisis, um, that we should really focus. On the social impact tourism can can give to hundreds of states in the world, and and I think most important is local participation. This was said also before. Um, the contribution of tourism to the local society, um, the development of of jobs, uh, of industries, of the society. Uh, what can it mean for small businesses? What can it mean for startups? Um, uh, it's it's much more than creating jobs. It's really uh, I think uh, developing um, um, the society and and only focusing on jobs for me would mean we would not have enough respect for 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 the countries and for the destinations. It's really growing together and and making the next step. And um, if social sustainability um, um, gets to the next step, uh, I would believe also ecological sustainability uh, will take the next step because um, if you have more money if you have money if people are in the jobs uh, you they, t they will care more for for the environment for sustainability uh, in the environment you can see this probably not not in europe i, I have an example which is far far away where we all cannot travel now at, at, in these times when you look on uh, the dominican republic and and haiti which is the same island uh, you could also see that there is not not only better education, better medical care in the Dominican Republic, but you have also more forests. Yeah, they they have more more green, uh, and and I would say this is going pari uh, uh, pari. Also, some very um, important points that you made, particularly about the citizen uh, participation. Um, Mr. Gary Wilson, as CEO of EasyJet Holidays, interestingly, a BBC report outlined that CO2 emissions per passenger per kilometer traveled indicated that the output for one passenger in a car was actually greater than for a de domestic flight. I don't include um, the secondary effects from high altitude, which are CO2 emissions. Um, just two weeks ago, French uh, lawmakers approved a bill to ban short domestic flights in an effort to lower the, carbon, the country's carbon emissions. So while this is admirable, what is the impact on the air travel industry, which is already under great strain in this last year. Um, yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for um, asking me to participate today. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly the airline industry has gone on, gone under a huge amount of stress um, over the last year, and it's been quite catastrophic as an industry to see the impact that the COVID has had. But before um, be, before um, COVID hit, there, there was there was a lot of discussions, as we're all aware of, of the the, the impact that aviation was having um, on the environment and the necessary steps that had to be taken in order to try to address this. Um, EasyJet, as, as, as the UK's large airline, we had about 100 million customers before um, the pandemic struck. So clearly we, we understand very clearly the kind of impacts that, that we can have um, on the environment and the importance of managing carbon. And, and that's why you know we've been very, very keen to 
to, to ensure that we're doing all that we can um, to, to go to renewable um, energies and also to look at, 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 at hydrogen and electric and, and develop new energies that, that aviation can actually adopt. And I think in the meantime, we've had a policy of carbon offsetting. We're the only uh, major airline in the world who, who carbon offset um, all of the carbon that we, we use in flying. But, but we see that as only the first step because really the, the key is that we can move towards um, new energy, hydrogen energy, hybrid electric energy, um, in order that the aviation can catch up with other transport um, sectors. Um, because clearly it's very important, people want to travel, and we see that people want to travel. We've seen the big negative impact um, socially, economically, um, by people not being able to travel during this pandemic. And it's absolutely essential that, that people can travel. And I think it's, it's, it's naive to say, we'll just travel less, we'll just fly less aircraft. Now, clearly the initiatives that France has taken, you know, where they're saying if there's a flight that, that you can, you can take, take part in a train that will be less than two hours, then why would you need to fly? Of course, we must have these considerations. Of course, we must have these conversations and they're sensible conversations to have. And these are, these are conversations that we EasyJet would encourage. However, I think that, that you know, we do also have to accept that, that people do want to travel and and to tax or to put costs that make this prohibitive for some is not the answer because it can't just be an industry for people with wealth and people who can afford to travel it needs to be an industry for everyone and i think therefore what we need to understand i would i would again agree with what the other panelists have said that that we need to understand the impacts both positive and negative that, that not just aviation, but that travel and, and, and holidays um, has um, on the destinations that we visit. And I wanted just to pick up on, on a point that you made earlier and, and some points made through the presentation. Um, I, I, I very much object to when I, when I hear that the, the term mass tourism has destroyed this or, or, or it's, it's mass tourism which is having a negative impact. Because I believe that mass tourism which is badly managed has a negative impact in the same way that specialist tourism, which is badly managed, has a negative impact as well. Mass tourism has an enormous benefit to the economies, to the destinations, to the communities that it visits. There was a, there was a study done actually some years ago by PwC and TUI um, actually in Cyprus, looking at the total impact measurement and management on Cyprus, um, both from an economic, a social, an environmental and a tax impact. And the output of that was that the, the, the positive benefits of that significantly outweighed the negative benefits in every one of those categories. But what, what was very important, I think, from that study in which I think um, Savas Padillas has talked about is understanding those negative impacts, engaging with the communities and the people who are bearing the burden of those negative impacts and ensuring that there is some way in which they can be beneficiaries from the positive impacts as well. And from a social perspective, that means, you know, having transport for people to get to and from hotels, having housing for people, which is acceptable, having a living wage for people, ensuring the taxation that's paid in the destinations is going into the people who need to benefit from it most. Because in that way, mass tourism can be a massive benefit um, to economies, to communities and to people. And I think that, it, we, we do need to have the debate um, as, as an industry and as, as a sustainable sector that, that, you know, there is a huge amount of good that mass tourism can do. Um, and even if it's things like, you know, the production and the consumption of resources or food, there's fantastic things that we can do from that respect. There's a, a project in, in, in Turkey, um, in Fethiye, where they're looking to, to, to be able to, to give the, the the, the large hotels, the customers in the large hotels, the food that they're consuming is grown by local farmers and the money goes to those local That's communities right. to grow the food. And I think projects like that are very, very important. You've brought up a very important uh, factor there at the end as well, as far as food is concerned. And I'm going to return uh, to that point uh, too. Uh, Mr. Fabrizio Orlando, uh, you're the Global Industry Relations Associate Director for uh, TripAdvisor and I'm wondering how many people log on and actually uh, make a search for sustainable tourism on your website. How important is it 
to your company and um, what steps are you taking in your approach uh, as the tourism sector opens? Yeah, uh, first thing first, I want to thank you, I want to join my fellow panelists and thank you, the CSTI, for the invite. I'm very happy to be here today and represent TripAdvisor. Um, I think that a lot of the things that everyone said before me are actually connected to your question because people do want to travel, and this is what we're seeing on TripAdvisor as well. We saw a spike in touring since the beginning of 2021, of course, and even last year when, unfortunately, we all know, uh, most of the world was closed. We were locked in our places. We were not allowed even to, to leave our houses, imagine travel. Um, we had less traffic, of course, but people were still going on TripAdvisor, making research, trying to get inspiration for their next trips. And I think that this speaks a lot of how important our industry is because it's an industry that makes people dream and, um, and, and something that actually speaks to people. Um, we have, alpha, well, before the pandemic, of course, we had 460 million unique users per month on TripAdvisor, so half a billion people that connected at least once on our platform to, to again, get inspiration to understand where they want to go, how they want to travel. And um, we've been pioneering a, a sustainable approach in travel, if you want. We launched our animal welfare policy some years ago. We don't sell any ticket or, for attractions that actually have um, wild animal kept in captivity. Mm -hmm. We launched in 2013 what we call the Green Leaders Initiative. We were basically awarding businesses, especially uh, hotels and BNBs, that were promoting in their establishment sustainable practices. We were giving them a badge to show to travelers and, of course, TripAdvisor users how good those businesses are in uh, putting in place sustainable practices. And um, since 2019, we actually joined, we created, a, we, we found, they found a, a coalition that is called Travelist, along with Booking.com, Skyscanner, Visa, and Ctrip, and of course, led by uh, the, Duke, so the Duke of Sussex, Prince Harry, we created the Travelist Coalition. And um, I think the, the key reason why we did that was that we saw that Green Leaders was having a lot of impact. We saw a, a spike in interest for travelers looking, actually, a green leaders properties on TripAdvisor, but we, we felt that what was missing was a bit of consistency. We realized that green leaders was something that was on TripAdvisor and TripAdvisor users, of course, knew about that, but we were missing an additional layer of consistency across our industry. And this is why we partner with our companies in the travel space. Um, and, and today you were asking me also how many people are looking at this type of activities. I can tell you that as per today, 32% of the activities, the experiences looked on TripAdvisor globally are experiences to be made in nature and parks. That means that people, and this goes actually, this is consistent with what we saw during the pandemic. People do really want to go out there, want to stay in outdoor spaces, want to enjoy nature. And, um, and I think even when, when we run a lot of studies, of course, at TripAdvisor, and some of the data that I have with me is 61% of our users told us that they are willing to spend more if they can stay in a sustainable accommodation. 72% of users told us that um, they, they feel actually better whenever they travel and they're able to stay in a green accommodation. And this is why we're giving them this information. We want travelers to know that there are sustainable alternatives for them. And I think Gary Wilson was mentioning earlier that it's important to consider that travel is not a, an industry for rich people. Everyone should and could travel. And I think that the reason why we, we, we created this Travelist Coalition, which aims, of course, at not only create consistency in our industry, but also at protecting destination, protecting local communities, making sure that we can have a real impact on travel, is also because we want to tap into the supply chain of our industry. We want to make sure that sustainable alternatives become cheaper so they can <coughs> afford them. In order to do that, we need also to work on, on both the supply and the demand, if you want. We need to make sure that travelers know that there are businesses that are implementing those activities, those sustainable initiatives, sustainable practices, and therefore can choose those establishments that then will drive, will, will lower the price. We, we need to tap what, what is called the intention action gap. Now we know that, especially the academics among us know that there's 
there's a gap between, there's a delta between what people say that they want to do and what they actually do. Long story short, wallets are more important than ideas, uh, often and unfortunately. So we need to make sure that we tap exactly into this gap and make sure that people that do want to travel in a more sustainable way can do that, both informing them of all the sustainable businesses out there and giving them the opportunities to, to book uh, a hotel, an Airbnb, whatever type of accommodation they want to go to, that is that is embedding sustainable practices in their business model for a not an astronomic price, but for a price that is similar, for a price point that is similar to the ones of non-sustainable accommodations. Um, we've just heard from uh, Mrs. Angela Guerrero, uh, president of the Greek National Tourism uh, Organization. Unfortunately, she is not able um, to be with us. So, to the rest of our uh, panelists, I'd like to uh, focus to begin um, our discussion on one of the main uh, pillars of sustainable tourism, uh, probably the most uh, important one, the economic one, uh, which is key now in trying to restart uh, the economies. Growth isn't really a key uh, concept that's been replaced by the idea of economic recovery. Are you all in agreement and how um, are you going to actually reach consensus on the way forward sometimes we know it's really difficult even for two people to agree so how are you going to get your whole um, government or your whole organization to focus and to agree on this sort of path forward i don't know if somebody would like to uh, get the ball rolling I'll try. Um, from a travel uh, foundation perspective, um, but also just from having been in this industry for many years and having led the National Tourism Office yeah. for the United States in this kind of uh, spiral that one goes through and coming back out of probably what is the biggest spiral we've ever been in. I um, really think that the focus is still on resetting with a rebalance. And when you're talking about growth, it still has to be managed. And I really appreciated Gary's comment about mass tourism, because I think it's been used as sort of a battering ram for how we didn't necessarily understand how incredibly uh, lucrative, but also lucrative socially, emotionally, as well as uh, financially that the growth in tourism was bringing to all of different destinations. And now as mass is the worry that people will get on and all of a sudden deluge uh, destinations. I think that we're at a different stage with the considerations and it's being able to put into practice as one was saying and Fabricio was very appropriate in trying to get a kind of centering on this. So I, I won't go on for too long, but I do want to bring out that collaboration is the biggest aspect. It's partnerships and collaboration down to cooperation. So the Travel Foundation uh, CEO, Jeremy Sampson, is chairing uh, an effort that's gone on called the Future of Tourism Collaboration Coalition. And this is a collaborative effort founded by six other NGOs, non-government organizations, to do exactly this, to work together and have a common ground. And they all came together to uh, agree on 19 guiding principles. And now they have 550 or more um, companies, destinations, uh, businesses that are uh, signing up to in agreement of trying to practice and make a commitment for these principles. And they're not in, in uh, outside of the line of travelist efforts as you're trying to do, Fabrizio. But I think that we're starting to come together in different ways. NGOs have never come together around the same table. They're usually competing. But there are intrinsic values in each of the NGOs that can be put into the same pot and complementary. So I think this is one of the big highlights that's happening by coming out of this and wanting to be responsible, but also to be 
coordinated, much more coordinated, and then uh, to value the partnerships that we have, such as with TUI Foundation, could be with EasyJet coming on board. It's all part of being able to say, we can do this together, not, oh, I'm just gonna do this standard, you do that one. And that's basically, and, and inside of that, and then I'll, I'll stop, Saskia, but the second part of that is, the, the initiative of Tourism Declares a Climate Emergency. Now we're supporting that um, effort because that is, as you said earlier, and certainly the minister said, this is front and center. And uh, we have got to be standing up much more uh, effectively than we have been in really working with the zoning planning boards, working in, in developing things that are actually sustainable in their own structure as well as financial, but appreciating that there are investments now in both the social and environmental aspects that travel and tourism is so contributing to. So you're on mute. You're on mute, Tracy. Mr. Ellebeck, I see that uh, you two wanted to interject and say something. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Saskia. Uh, well, first, also, I, I want to underline what, what Gary said. Uh, I think you can, can also use um, when a lot of travelers are going to a destination or to a hotel screen, you can also scale much better the, uh, the, the sustainable initiatives you start probably. And um, uh, also you can use, uh, let's, I don't want to say probably it's not the, the, the nicest word, your power, but you can, can influence uh, your partners much stronger at some time to, to go in the right direction or in the more sustainable direction. You can train them, you can educate them. There are a lot of small hotels probably, they have not, um, well, the capabilities, they have not the teams um, to prepare themselves and then uh, it's it's very helpful when you when you do it uh, as a as a bigger hotel or tourism company or together with a travel foundation that you really start how how to to train um, also the teams uh, on the ground um, how they can become more sustainable because my my experience is that most of the also the private hoteliers they are. They ask for more, more knowledge. They ask for the support in this, but um, that responsibility, I would say, as um, um, the, the tourism groups um, to give this kind of, of support, education, experience, also um, this um, study which was mentioned by, by Gary and in the meantime in the chat we got the number. I think um, uh, uh, George said uh, 84 uh, euros Per, uh, per guest and night uh, uh, will be the contribution for the for the destination uh, when when holidaymakers are coming to a destination. So I don't see I don't see a, a, a contrast between uh, on the one hand growth and becoming more sustainable sustainable in the in the in the industry and also in the in the uh, hotel groups and in the in the tourism groups. I think it's most, most important that sustainability is something which is which becomes well part of the strategy and of the business, which is not something in a staff function uh, only, so that everybody in the business understands that there is a business behind. And and for example, when I started in this industry, um, but I, I was told we have uh, as, as two years, we have a Robinson Club in in Morocco in Agadir. Um, uh, with solar panel and they produce uh, the full energy of this, the Robinson Club and for the neighborhood uh, with this, uh, with this uh, Robinson Club. And I asked myself, wow, most of our hotels are in, in countries uh, where the sun is shining, in Spain, in Greece, in Cyprus. Why don't we have more uh, hotels with solar panel? So what, what can we do to, to, to improve here? Uh, or when you, when you look on construction of hotels today, um, so you can get a silver standard, you can get a gold standard, you get a platinum standard when you construct a hotel. It's when you construct your own hotels, but also when you work with, with partners. Um, and, and we discussed about um, to, to involve everybody in the, in the business areas, in the, in the business decisions uh, that, we, that we asked for the future to get, a, to get a regular business case for everything and a green case. So that we can make the board the decision. Also, probably the the uh, green case is not 
uh, as profitable as the regular case, but we can make the decision. We, we see both cases and then we can have a look uh, what can be um, a right for the future, for, 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 for the company, for sustainability, for uh, saving uh, uh, energy. And, and there, there are a lot of things. Also, when you, when, you, when you plan a new hotel, how you construct the hotel, but also how you design the palm garden. Because um, when you design the palm garden today, you know the water consumption for the next 20 years in this hotel. So there is a business case uh, uh, behind sustainability. Um, and that, that, that's why I think it's so important that um, it, it becomes really part of the strategy of the mindset of, of people um, in, a, in the company and we are working hard and when you look on in the last years we have certified 83 percent of our home hotels uh, and uh, when i look back on the last sustainability strategy um, there have been uh, 45 45 million greener and fairer holidays uh, in the last uh, five years uh, which is a huge number or we started also um, with the sustainable, the sustainable um, excursions, um, and uh, I think this also it's a decision the customer will get in the destination whether he will take really a local, authentic experience. We talked before about authentic experience, art, food, culture, uh, or he take uh, or the customer takes something different. But it's on us to to develop it. And I would say it's on us to, to, to promote it and to convince the customers um, because they will get a, I think, I'm sure they will get a better experience in the, in the destination. Um, customers are also more satisfied uh, with the destination when they, they, when they have an authentic experience and local touch and also uh, local products. Um, I think that uh, I need to bring in uh, Mr. Berdios uh, now um, to follow up on your point about the hotels and the construction of the hotels. We know that this is quite um, a sore point. Um, if we look around how many hotels actually have solar panels, despite being an island that has almost 362 days of uh, sunshine, um, we're not there. How are we going to make these uh, modifications, uh, Mr. Berrios, in order to make um, the, the, the uh, strategy sustainable and for hotels and uh, infrastructures such as that to actually realize that they can benefit uh, financially, economically, and never mind even environmentally if they haven't been directed in that way yet. Quite easy, actually. Don't give them money. Uh, don't give them money unless uh, they have uh, sustainability credentials. And uh, yeah, I think uh, bit by bit is going to um solve itself and you know i mean that as a bit of a um uh between a joke and uh, being serious because now actually uh, since we're talking about the economic recovery as well um the recovery fund from the eu um you know that money most of which is uh, coming in to destinations in terms of uh, grants not even loans yeah it comes with an asterisk and that asterisk says you need to be focusing on making, let's say, your tourism industry more competitive. You need to be making it more digital and you need to be making it more green. So for the first time, there is a green element attached to uh, money that is then going to be given to the destinations and to businesses uh, in order to improve um, their product. And that's why I started by saying, um, if there are green prerequisites in the funding of projects, in the renovation of hotels, in the upgrade of facilities, and all of that, um, it gives a message that, first of all, yes, there is a plan behind that development um, uh, and that no money is going to be shared with businesses that uh, don't care about the environment and don't care about uh, sustainability, uh, uh, the social aspect, etc., and it gives the message more generally that okay, things are changing. The EU cares more about this now, um, so the government cares more about this now, and above all, um, the customer cares more about this uh, as well because people now are traveling with a purpose. So 
Yeah, I have to say, Saskia, to answer your question, um, I think finally, for the first time, um, things are in motion. Um, the EU has done something uh, within the recovery fund. And what is even better is that the US uh, has come out in the last couple of weeks and has totally blown out uh, everybody else in terms of uh, their sustainability vision, et cetera. So uh, it means that, um, you know, there's a huge message there that uh, a big power like the US, um, President Biden is really serious about this. And um, they realize in the US that this is gonna be a competitive advantage going forward. And at the end of the day, uh, this is how competition works. If uh, such big um, companies or um, blocks like the EU have uh, taken this on board, I think it's a one-way street from this point um, forward. Thank you. Um, Mr. Wilson. Yes, I, I, I just wanted to make the point that I, I think actually when you look at Cyprus, and it's an interesting one because I, I agree absolutely with, with um, what Mr. Ellebeck and, and, and what Mr. Perdius have said, that, that you know, if, if, if we can ensure that in policy from the beginning, whether it's building hotels, building infrastructure, um, or giving incentives um, to hoteliers in order to deliver from a sustainable perspective, that's exactly the thing to do. But I, I would, I mean, I would say, I, I, I've, I mean, I've worked in the industry now for, for, for longer than I care to remember and have been to many, many destinations many, many times. And I think, you know, Cyprus has got a lot to be proud of. I mean, some of the best hotels in Cyprus from an environmental perspective are some of the best hotels in the world from an environmental perspective. You know, whether it is how they deal with energy, how they deal with wastewater, how they deal with food production and consumption, some fantastic fantastic examples in Cyprus of hotels who absolutely are embracing um, a sustainable ethos and how they, they develop. And these aren't 10 and 15 room hotels. These are two and 300 room hotels. And they're doing this in a very, very um, kind of proactive and, 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 and forward facing way. So I think that the fact that this is being done currently in Cyprus should act as a showcase for other hoteliers and other businesses to see how it can be done. And we don't need to look too far outside of Cyprus for that. Mm. Um, this is uh, Epler Wood. Yes, thank you. I'm um, really happy to hear the discussion on the third pillar. I have been attending uh, the EU uh, forums on this topic as well and had other representatives with us at Harvard. Uh, one of the things though that you know, our report did conclude is, is that if we leave uh, the green infrastructure strictly 100% to the private sector, obviously it will distribute itself with the wealthier corporations taking the lead, which is, Great. I mean, obviously, anyone would want to see that happening. But overall, uh, a destination is composed of, you know, generically 80% small and medium enterprise. Okay. And that may be different in Cyprus. I don't have that figure. Uh, but nonetheless, in order to achieve uh, the third pillar, I see it as more than just in incentives to private uh, corporations that can make the transition on their own with their own capital, right? Which is what I did discuss, that there has to be additional capital. And I mean, it's a great conversation where certainly the EU seems positioned to respect the need right now for that additional capital. And I would just uh, challenge the the leadership here to think beyond the largest corporations and, and how to build out a more sustainable destination uh, with the kind of incentives that perhaps if the EU were to have the right metrics so that they could see the transition happening without the monitoring, they can't trust the results is the bottom line. And so I think it's very important that that uh, you know, participation as Helen brought up and the, the sort of infrastructure monitoring that I brought up is, and ultimately the incentive structure that has been brought up by the minister or the deputy minister, I think has to be considered for the full component of businesses and residents. For example, sustainable infrastructure has to include the residents. And we're so that to, creates a, a special challenge. Thank you. We're, we're going to come back and uh, to Mr. Berrios, I see that you have your hand up. So we'll come back to you in a second. Um, we just want to send uh, uh, a message now, a very important message that we see about uh, plastic. Keep our 
uh, sand and sea plastic free. Can you hear the waves breaking on the sand? Can you feel the soft morning sun on your face as you relax on the beach? The coolness of the turquoise waters? Now, can you feel that plastic bag getting caught on your foot as you swim? That plastic wrapper you just stepped on? That discarded face mask that's trapping small turtles? Is this really what you want to experience? Cyprus is full of beautiful beaches. We love them, so we have to protect them. 80% of the waste collected on our beaches is plastic. Plastic litter kills seabirds and marine mammals, while microplastics are swallowed by fish, entering our food chain. This means that we end up eating the plastic too. If we don't do something, by 2050, there will be more plastic than fish in our seas. With a few small, simple acts, we can make a big difference. We can rethink our choices. We can refuse unnecessary plastics like straws and excess packaging. We can reduce our plastic use by choosing alternative materials, such as glass, paper or fabric. Hotels, restaurants and other local businesses can contribute by continuing to cut down on single-use plastic. Also, we don't need to throw away everything after one use. We can reuse plastic containers and bags and bring our own reusable coffee cups. And of course, we must recycle. Look out for the designated recycling bins. By cutting down on single-use plastics, we protect our seas and our beaches. We conserve our marine wildlife. We rethink our actions and make Cyprus an even more attractive place to be. We protect what we love for now and for future generations. We keep our sand and sea plastic free. Mr. Verdios, can you tell us a little, uh, picking up on uh, what Mrs. Epler Wood said about uh, the responsibility of the government to actually uh, pull everybody in together? Um, maybe notoriously, we've always uh, gone uh, in separate compartments. Maybe now it's time to really look at it as a global whole and how can everybody, even the small players, have a very valuable contribution that they can actually make. How are you, maybe you're in the ideal position now to be able to pull it all together, uh, to draw on uh, Mrs. Uh, Eplerwood's uh, very salient comments that she made in her presentation? Yeah, that's a great question actually. Uh, and uh, a difficult one. But I'm glad that uh, Cyprus, through its national tourism strategy, um, has already um, started following this advice from um, uh, Mrs. Wood. Um, you know, we, we took a lot of care in drafting the national tourism strategy in a way that all stakeholders uh, were consulted. Um, this happened over a course of uh, several uh, years, a lot of face-to-face -face contact with us. And um, everybody in Cyprus now knows the pillars of our national tourism strategy. They know where we're moving towards. And um, we are very open about um, informing the whole tourism com community um, about what the action plan every year is, so that it leads up to 2030. There is a separate action plan for every year. And we come out publicly at the beginning of every year announcing that action plan. And we go back to the minister's cabinet, parliament, the private sector, but also the people of Cyprus, telling them every four months where we are in terms of implementation. 
So last year, for example, um, we implemented 95% of everything that was on our action plan, which is a massive percentage, especially if you think that we are in the middle of a pandemic. We're not only working towards the future, we actually need to focus as well on now getting the country out of this mayhem, making sure we're supporting businesses, making sure we're, we're supporting employees. So that's a huge percentage, 95%, uh, everything uh, taken into consideration. And you know, this openness, uh, it's a bit scary at the beginning, but uh, then you realize that everybody needs to hear these things. Everybody needs to be aware. Uh, we need to open ourselves up to um, criticism um, or feedback. You can call it uh, um, uh, anything you want. Feedback. Yeah, feedback. Uh, constructive feedback, actually. That's a, that's a great um, phrase. So, yeah, we, we see the benefits of being so open in our approach. And uh, we try to lead by doing because when we say that we are trying to spread, let's say, the benefits from tourism across the whole island, it's not just words. We as a ministry have visited 220 villages in the last 12 months. Wow. We did, we, yeah, we didn't just go to say, hi, how are you? <laughs> We've gone to explain our vision, train face to face, um, show them our schemes, our incentive schemes, how we can support, not only with know-how, but financially, how we can bring them on board uh, to our vision. So it's a very grassroots, hands-on approach, uh, and it couldn't be more grassroots and uh, more hands-on like, uh, than this. When us pe personally, myself included, going one-to-one -to, -one to these communities, explaining to them what tourism is gonna look like in the future, uh, and what we need, we need to be doing because, you know, uh, people might not be informed. People might not have been in tourism in the past. Maybe they are thinking of getting into tourism now in order to provide these experiences, etc. So we do that at, at a very uh, uh, grassroots level. And the second thing I want to say, uh, probably it's something that would come up uh, anyway uh, later on. Um, and related to your question, uh, Saskia, about getting everybody on board. You know, sometimes um, I feel that uh, visitors from abroad are unfairly criticized or penalized uh, for everything that's dirty in a destination. Um, I, I think we should look at ourselves first. Uh, this is a very, I, I want to pick up on this point, please, because um, it's all part of being an active citizen. And unfortunately, uh, we, if we're going to be very honest, we have only a very small sector of the community and um, the, the, the people in Cyprus actually acting in a responsible manner. We need to change that. We talk about education, we talk about uh, programs, we talk about going to the schools. Um, what about this self-responsibility? How are we going to get that going? Even if we just take it back to the uh, pandemic now and we say to everybody, you know, put on your masks, uh, please go and be vaccinated. And of course, this is not something only um, uh, to do with Cyprus. This has got to do with, with everybody because it affects, it's affected everybody. So how do we activate our citizens to be part of the change, uh, to be part of the sustainable thought process so that if we're okay here, we can show it out to the rest of the, the people and the tourists will actually follow. Yeah, well, I'll tell you the two things that we've done um, and I think both are necessary. I mean, as a government, we will be spending almost uh, 2 million euros um, in the next weeks to clean up the whole destination. Wow. Uh, but that is not the solution when you clean no. up after people, okay? No. Uh, it needs something deeper than that. And, one of the positives, if I may say so, from last year is that we are now able to say, hold on a minute. There was a lot of uh, dirty places last year in Cyprus, a lot of dirt here and there, a lot of litter. There were no tourists. Who did that? 
Was it the birds? No, it was not the birds. It was us, people who live here. So the second part of what we, uh, we're going to be doing, we're launching a campaign now of information, of right. making people more sensitive to this, but from a tourism perspective. Uh, we're, it's not going to be a campaign which typically says, you know, don't throw um, things on the floor or uh, recycle, etc. We are bringing in stories from tourism and how tourism is affected negatively from uh, this litter here and there. And we are creating stories that um, are applicable in everybody's daily life so that we finally realize we cannot expect to um, have tourism or we cannot uh, demand from visitors to treat our country with respect if we are actually the first who don't treat it with respect. So I think you need this dual approach, um, information, sensitization, but obviously a bit of um, cleaning and a lot of money being spent to clean up, but cleaning up after people is not a solution. I think that you've um, outlined uh, and answered actually one of the questions that uh, we have many, many questions coming in. So I'm going to slowly move uh, to those uh, from Amani uh, Vernescu, um, who says, uh, taking into consideration the impact of tourism on the environment as well as the speed of revenge tourism. Um, I'm not quite sure what she means by that. Are there plans for a campaign emphasizing, perhaps in clear bullet points, what actions tourists can take to be more eco-friendly during their holidays? Well, there you have it from Mr. Perdios. Uh, we need to be uh, more accountable ourselves. Um, uh, COVID-19 has also illustrated a very important link between public health and tourism. And I'm wondering how will each sector invest in building trust with the tourist once again? And also from the staff perspective, how are um, each of you going to cope with staff uh, working together and getting them actually uh, interacting and talking with one another again while staying safe. Uh, Mr. Wilson, would you like to start the ball rolling? Um, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. I, I mean, I think obviously, as as you know, industries have have you know, airlines have been grounded, tourism industries have been grounded, hotels have been closed. Um, the one thing we've not lacked in the last year is time to actually think about biosecurity and think about the measures that we need to take in order to make sure that our people are safe, that our customers are safe and that we're following the, the, the best practice with, when it comes to that. So I, I actually think that there is, uh, we shouldn't underestimate the, the huge amount of investment both in time, in human resources and in um, financial resources that the industry as individual organizations and umbrella industries have put into this um, to ensure that our customers and our staff and our people are going to be safe. And I think that, you know, that, that, that not only, you know, when you look at it from a very top level of the, the vaccination program that's taking place across Europe down to the protocols when you get on an aircraft, the protocols when you get to a hotel and the protocols, you know, when your children are going to a kids club or you're visiting the destinations or resorts, I think that customers will never have been better in Formed or better um, educated on the importance of following these protocols. And I think that when we just look back to the very brief period that we had last year when tourism opened, I mean, I think as an industry, we can be extraordinarily proud of the players within the industry and of the customers and of the communities that we visited in terms of how we all adopted that approach to ensuring that everyone was looked after and that we were looking after each other in the process of that. And I think that we will only see more of that when, when, when the, the, the destination start to open again. Mr. Elabek? Yeah, I agree. Only, only a few words to add. I'm, I'm completely with Gary Wilson. This industry can really, really be proud how this was managed last year. When we look back one year ago, there was no vaccination, nothing. The crisis has started in, in March. Um, there have been no self-tests available at this time. This year, we have um, vaccination from, well, I would say minimum four supplier, probably five, six. I do not know uh, about the EMA licenses now, but we have vaccination. We have 
a number of providers now. We have self, we, we, we can use self-tests and we have been successful last year uh, with summer holidays, with a good summer period uh, in this circumstances, as Gary Wilson also said. And um, I would say the, the alignment between the destination, is, especially, and I will also mention um, Cyprus, Cyprus, Greece, um, Spain. So there has been such a close contact between the, the governments and the tourism industry to develop well, the best ways to make safe travel. And I think we delivered safe travel. And uh, I read a lot in, also in some papers in Central Europe, also in Germany, about uh, the second wave and the holiday makers. But this hasn't been the, the travelers uh, which have been on package holiday uh, with uh, 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 EasyJet or with Stewie or with others. As this have been um, overland trips uh, where families have been have been met and and uh, you have been a lot of uh, meetings between family members and, and and contacts. So I would say um, there have been a lot of learnings last year in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a in a environment which was not very really clear for all of us without vaccination without tests. And this year, we have uh, another 12 months where we made our, had our, our learnings, where we have had our exchange. Uh, and I can always say I, I'm, I'm extremely proud um, about the behavior of the customers because the customers, um, uh, also when they're in the destination, when they're in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in, in Cyprus or in other places, um, the, they behave very responsible and, and, um, and, and they, they follow the rules. Um, and on the other hand, um, the investment, the destination, and the companies have done in the last year, um, and, and it was really great uh, collaboration uh, between all of us. Uh, Mrs. Marano? Yes, I just wanted to make a brief point that uh, in your uh, question on trust, um, I think it is about uh, trust for the travelers, trust for the workforce but it's trust for the residents. And I think that um, Tom's, just, Thomas's uh, statement about um, the behavior was uh, good and people were respecting it, but there's also uh, some of the backlash of the tra travelers coming back to a destination will be having to first address the residents level of hesitancy to be the host. And to the qu question of responsible traveler behavior uh, starting from home, I think if we can approach uh, more effectively reaching the citizens and the residents to say, is this how you would have your home be? Let them get into their own sense of uh, sensibilities of how they manage their own household, hopefully relatively responsibly, and, uh, have, and just make them see that that's what we're doing with the country and we need you to complement the same way. Um, I want to move now to uh, some of the questions that we're um, receiving uh, from uh, Charlotte. Uh, this is directed to all the panelists. From my experience, she says, only tourists who are aware about sustainable tourism consider and prefer staying in sustainable accommodation. However, there are still many people who are not aware and they don't care. Are there strategies to convince tourists themselves to act more sustaining, uh, sustainably? Can I can I can I jump in on that question? Because I think I think actually it, it's it's a very interesting point, and I think for too long, for too many years, um, the, the industry relied on the customer to say, you know, this is what I want. And they said, well, we'll deliver it like a product. And I think that, you know, if we look back only some years ago, you'd, you'd see, you know, a range of holidays from tour operators, and then they'd have a little green section and say, these are the green holidays. You know, that, that's a very outdated concept. And I think those forward looking organizations absolutely understand the business case of sustainability. They understand that if you buy, if you build hotels in a sustainable way, they'll last longer. They understand that if you have energy um, kind of protocols calls in your hotels if you have really good food sourcing and, 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 and growing your consumption if you have really good staff um, staff kind of policies in place that you'll keep the best staff that actually the customers will come back 
And I think many, many, many companies will, will be able to show you that, you know, where you have adopted sustainable practices in your hotels, in your tourism organization, then you make better profit because you're better repeat customers and you've got much better satisfaction. And I think that is, that is the new approach to sustainability that customers just see it as the smart choice because they'll have better holidays on the back of it. The yes. suppliers will, will make more money and have a more sustainable business and everyone in the round will be happier. And therefore, if there's education as part of that, that's a good thing. But I think it really starts from the supply. Uh, Mr. Nettler, what? If I can add very quickly. Yes. Oh, uh, TripAdvisor, please go first. <laughs> no, because I think it's very interesting what, what Gary said, and I totally agree because that's, that's a starting point for travelists as well. We realized that we need to tap on both ends of, of the supply chain. And of course, the travelers that do care about sustainable alternatives are the ones that travel more sustainably, but our goal as TripAdvisor and as travelists is also to make sure that everyone gets an easy access to this information. This is why we created the coalition to, to go back to Ellen's point about collaboration. No one can solve this issue alone. We need to collaborate. And if you think about a classic travel journey, you would probably have 90%, around 90% of travelers that would go either on TripAdvisor or on Booking.com or on Skyscanner or on Trip.com. And when we create consistency, when we are able to showcase all the businesses that are doing something concrete to be more sustainable and to offer sustainable alternatives at a normal price and not a, a higher price point, you realize that we are informing these people. I was mentioning at the beginning, we, we had prior to the pandemic, half a billion unique users per month. It means that almost everyone in our planet that travels goes at least once on TripAdvisor booking, et cetera, et cetera. And you can get those information. If you can get, have access to businesses that are sustainable, that are implementing sustainable practices, and you can even deep dive and see, you know what, I do care more about this type of sustainable initiative versus this other one. You can make an informed decision. And that's, and that's why I think we're doing our best to make sure that everyone has an easy access to this information that are easy to compare, easy to digest, that are consistent so that we can convince, of course, travelers to travel in a more sustainable way. But as to Gary's point, we need to convince owners to be more sustainable, to, to implement sustainable practices in their business. And I think that incentives and transparency are the best ways if you think about it. We, we want to be transparent in how we assess whether or not the property is sustainable on, on TripAdvisor, Booking.com, Skyscanner, et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, when I give them an incentive, which is what Green Leaders does at, at TripAdvisor, having this badge showcasing the fact that this property is actually sustainable is, if you want, an incentive of, of some sort. So it can drive more more, more, more click-through rate, more clicks, of course, on, on the property, and therefore more bookings on the long term. Um, if uh, briefly, uh, Mrs. Uh, epler and uh, Mrs. Marano to round up on uh, this uh, question. Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say again that if every business seeks to create that impression, it's good, but we know underneath the surface there are society-wide problems. Let's just take recycling. Um, you know, a individual small property to big property can't really solve that problem without municipal participation in recycling programs. Uh, we see that with water, sustainable water provision as well. So I think what I'm trying to instill in everyone is, is that this has to be a public-private vision because once the destination and the ministry or a new version of that arises, the, the destination will become the draw as a value added place to go that is sustainable. That will give every single one of the businesses a value add, but it has to be a joint enterprise, not just a bunch of small collaborations. Right. This has to be at the top. Right. right. Yes. Mr. Marano? I, she's pretty much, Meg has covered a lot of it. Okay. I just wanted to, to echo um, Gary's statement that I just don't think, you just don't give them a choice. 
no choice. Don't say, am I sustainable or not sustainable? Make the goal that we continue to move forward in this arena by the better aircraft building that's going on, the kind of biofuel testing that's going on. And just have it be, not have it communicated that you can come here versus there. And I think that that's another right. aspect to be considered. Right. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to uh, bring in Mr. Noel Josephides um, now, uh, Chairman of Sunville Holidays and the Travel Foundation, uh, former ABTA Chairman and long-standing Director of the Association, Association of Independent uh, Tour Operators. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, where are we? Oh, there um, well, I've been involved in Cyprus for many, many years, um, since 1989, when I remember uh, the Countryside Commission in the UK was called in to help set up the Laona project, uh, which was funded by the Lorendis Foundation then. Um, over the years, there have been some very uh, interesting conversations in Cyprus. And um, I'm very glad to see that slowly that has begun to change, that there's far more awareness of what needs to be done. And it's, it's very encouraging to uh, hear what Mr. Perdios is, is doing. Uh, and it's, uh, it's about time too. If there's one point that um, I'd, I'd like to make is that it's, it's not only the beaches in Cyprus which are the problem. If you put on a mask and look beneath the waves, then you see a great deal of pollution. And certainly one of the very big problems is the agricultural sector. And I've made this point before. Um, the agricultural sector has a lot of greenhouses which are covered with plastic. And when they are no longer used, that plastic breaks up and, um, and just uh, washes into the sea. There has to be a lot of coordination uh, between the various government departments in Cyprus. The government departments are never good at speaking to each other. It's not uh, unique to Cyprus, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, the tourism industry is so important in Cyprus that in, in many respects, it should, it should take the lead and that uh, the government as a whole should recognize that uh, the tourism sector uh, should um, hold a lot of power in, in, in determining how the um, uh, in initiatives uh, uh, are undertaken. I, I think that um, that's why they now have the uh, Deputy uh, Tourism uh, Ministry so that exactly that can be done and there can be actually quite a very specific focus. And then of course there's there's the development of the mountainous regions in Cyprus yes. uh, which I suppose have fallen out of fashion uh, when, when I was young. Uh, that's where we used to go on holiday. Uh, it's, uh, it, it would be good to see them revived. Um, it will need money and uh, that, that money has to be forthcoming. You, you cannot revive those areas, which are very much the green and natural areas of, of the island. Uh, you, you can't um, revive them simply by talking about it. Uh, you, you have to spend the money um, in order to, to promote, to upgrade the accommodation that's available there, uh, which does need upgrading. And uh, again, I know that this is on the... Uh, uh, on the government's program, which is very good to see. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Mr. Jeremy Sampson, CEO of uh, Travel Foundation, uh, would also uh, like to interject. Mr. Sampson. Uh, maybe, maybe we've lost him. Um, I, so I'd like to take another question based actually on the uh, 
whilst uh, Mr. Josephini said we have some uh, question from Jonathan uh, addressed to Mr. Berrios. Uh, what are you doing to help the scuba diving industry uh, about KPIs? Uh, scuba diving is hugely sustainable. We contribute to the environment via the underwater world, removing plastics and raising awareness of projection to the oceans and aquatic life. Uh, the industry needs more diving sites to develop the aquatic life and contribute more to the tourism GDP. Are you aware that the Zenobia alone contributes uh, 22 million a year in diving tourism? Is there a diving tourism plan? Oh, a lot of questions in the one, uh, similar to the one that Maltz has produced, which has been highly successful. Um, maybe you can uh, just uh, elaborate on that for us, Mr. Berrios. Yeah, that was a huge question. Uh, um, it was. <laughs> but <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Um, I couldn't agree more that uh, diving tourism uh, is very important to us. Uh, it should be even more important. Uh, before, though, we go ahead and uh, discuss about further growth in this segment, for us, the most important thing currently is to finally have a law for this sector of the tourism economy. Um, we don't even have a law right now. How, I, if you've actually brought up laws, um, having them is great. Not having them means that we need to put them. It's maybe a, a, a little of a challenge, but what about the implementation of them? Yeah, that's that a great seems, question, Saskia. That seems um, to be so difficult. Why can't we implement? Um, you know, the the fact that a law was absent uh, and that nobody was taking responsibility for it, whether drafting it or following it up, um, you know, we we decided at the ministry to take the responsibility ourselves. So. We are drafting that law as we speak, of course, with the engagement of all the stakeholders related to diving. Um, and we will be responsible as well for issuing the permits and following them up, following up on whether the standards are being kept, um, the ISOs, um, the health aspect of that, the environmental aspect, of course, with help from um, the private sector, but we have undertaken that responsibility. And um, yes, as soon as uh, the law is in place, we will feel more confident and comf comfortable to talk about um, a master plan of development and further enhancement of, um, of this special uh, form of tourism. But uh, you know, at the moment, uh, the most important thing is the law, Saskia. Uh, I don't think it's uh, correct to just go out and uh, make uh, growth plans and the investment plans when a basic law is not even in place. And, uh, you know, it's a fantastic um, product to have, but a law is required. And I, I want to go back a little bit to what Megan was saying before. Uh, sometimes governments have been guilty of misallocating uh, the tourism euros or tourism pounds or tourism dollars with regards to infrastructure um, uh, investments in the destination. Um, because in order to invest correctly um, and sustainably, whether this is for um, um, circularity, whether it's uh, about waste management, water management, etc., cetera, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to charge the customer more money or the tour operator more money or the airline more money. It doesn't mean that more money is needed from anybody. Uh, what it does mean is that we need to be doing a better job of allocating the taxes we already receive to things that are really going to be uh, sustainable, um, green focused. And this is exactly why uh, we are now undertaking and commissioning this study uh, on the environmental principles of our national tourism strategy and the carrying capacity. As soon as we understand the exact cost of every arrival to Cyprus, we will then be able to um, 
create the policies required to mitigate that. And this is what has been missing so far. And um, Megan, you, you made an unbelievable uh, point before and uh, you're spot on. Um, I'd like to move to another really important um, and rather worrying factor, and uh, that is food waste. It's probably one of the most worrying factors uh, of the tourism sector. Each year, a third of all food produced is lost or wasted. And I was appalled to see that it actually relates to 1.3 billion tons. 1.3 billion tons. Uh, food waste is also responsible for an astonishing 8% of global carbon emissions. When one thinks of all the water, uh, energy, and other sources um, used to produce, transport, process, and sell food. How are each of you addressing this in your uh, sector? How have you been able to um, mobilize uh, action? The, maybe the one of the first is that we, we think of the buffet. People take much more than they eat so, um, and that they need. So how are we going to do it? And then, of course, that, that food gets thrown away uh, because of uh, hygiene. We need to throw away all untouched food. So would anybody like to um, tell us how you're addressing this? I'm happy to, to start if you want, because um, uh, we, have, we have done some experiences with this. Probably it's also again, what I said before, uh, when you start to, to construct a hotel, in the best case, if you have a hotel which is, which is uh, um, in operation, it's, it's different, then you have to probably rebuild. But if you construct a hotel, it's the ways, how you, how you uh, steer the guests to the buffets, that you have not, not only one buffet, that you are working with two, three, four buffets in the room so that you can have the full buffet probably at, at six and seven and later um, at eight you only want to have one buffet in the room. And uh, the other point is um, also, again, uh, to, to, to talk to your customers, to, to, to your guests, they are very open. So we have done our experience on the cruise ships. We had a project uh, on uh, mine ship on Tui Cruises. Uh, this was uh, about how to avoid uh, food waste, and we informed people. We had small, uh, small uh, uh, posters um, on the table, and we told them how many food um, is is done uh, into the waste. And uh, we also explained to them, well, there is enough for everybody, um, uh, and and uh, you will have a full buffet at six, at seven, at eight, or at nine, uh, but take only. Um, um, the food you want to eat, really. And uh, this was a very good uh, open process with the customers. And uh, I got a lot of very positive feedback because we, at the beginning, we have been not really sure whether it's, it's good to tell your guests um, uh, when they come to the table, um, well, um, th there might be a risk that you take too much food and that the food will, uh, will go to the waste later. Um, uh, but it was very much accepted and uh, guests asked about and they want to get more information and then they understood, um, uh, yes, there is enough. And uh, this is uh, an experience from the, from the cruise ship, from mine ship. Um, to cruises, but um, the other thing is uh, uh, really in the hotels uh, about education of, of guests and, and talking to them and also to organize your, your operation in, in that way. Um, Mr. Wilson, uh, has the airline industry managed uh, to reduce this uh, extravagance or waste rather um, by making it purchasable? Have you found that that's altered things? <laughs> That's always one way. That's always one way to reduce the food waste is to make it purchasable. But yes, I'll 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 I'll, I'll speak a little bit about aviation, and I'll I'll speak a bit about my opinion on hotels as well. Um, I think in aviation, I mean, it's 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 probably exactly the same that we will see in hotels. I mean, we we have an enormous amount now. The, the digitization of business means you've got an enormous amount of data that that tells you exactly how consumers are behaving. So it's so, so you can very easily and and very precisely now predict what the food customers are going to want to consume on any specific route or any specific time of the day or any specific month or any specific destination. And of course, again, 
you know, that, that, that running airlines, running hotels, their businesses, you know, and, and it's not in the interest of, of either of those businesses to have huge food waste because that's money that's been spent that goes down the drain. And therefore, I do think that the, the advent and advance of technology really helps you manage that kind of waste that, that, that maybe we have seen in the past. But one point I would make, I feel a bit of an expert in food waste at the moment, is the UK, as I'm sure many other European countries, as, as part of the beginning of the pandemic, seemed to stock up on the world's supply of pasta and baked beans and any kind of tinned food that they're now all looking to get rid of because they realised they didn't actually like tinned beans at the beginning, even though they bought cases and cases off at the household. Um, I think that, that, that when you look at the, the matter of food in hotels and in destinations, we have to go back to food production. And I think that's a very important point as well, because, again, over the years, I've, I've been baffled by the amount of food miles that, that, you know, a lot of the food that's consumed in the hotel goes through. So, again, I mentioned the project in, in Fetier that was carried out actually with the Travel Foundation. And, and there previously, there were huge amounts of food grown in the regions of the hotel. It was collected up and then it was moved hundreds of miles north where it was then put through processing and it was then brought back down again in order to be served in the hotels. And just by looking at that chain of the food being grown to the food being consumed, you can cut out an enormous amount of food miles by just really focusing on ensuring that you're giving customers food that's grown by locals in local areas, you know, within their area as well. And the second point I would bring, again, it's my, when I have my hat on that, that gets annoyed about the mass tourism being, you know, associated with, with negativity. The buffet in turn is seen as mass tourism, which is negative. There is nothing more efficient than the buffet. And I think it is a real mistake to think that hotels which run buffets are very inefficient. The amount of energy that is put into producing food for two, three, four, six hundred customers in a buffet is minimal in comparison to try to feed three, four hundred people who are sitting down ordering from a menu and you're making those individually. So actually, when you look at it from end to end, I think that, you know, that, that good technology practices that allow you to understand how much the consumer is going to uh, or the customer is going to be eating and consuming, um, working in a, in, a, in a productionized environment where you're buying the food locally and, you know, producing that for a buffet environment, I think is the most environmentally friendly way in which to feed customers and leads to the least amount of food waste. Uh, Mr. Orlando, what, what is the ground level reaction of customers and uh, consumers? Do you think that they are more aware? I think they are, especially in new generations. We're seeing a, a, an increasing interest in everything that, that speaks to sustainability. On, uh, on one end, I think I want to go back to the intention action gap I was mentioning in the beginning. And I think that, I think it's true for older generations, for new generations in, um, in general. And I was reading a, a very, very interesting article a couple of days ago, and they were mentioning this study was saying basically one of the way in which some companies have been trying to, to solve for this issue was to use social influence. And the idea, you know, that we can influence each other and, um, and by influencing each other, we can shift behavior of communities and telling, and it's very similar to, to what Thomas was mentioning before, telling people you can go there, you can get, you, you can go to the buffet table how many times you want, you don't have to go just once. I think really changed the approach of people. And this study was, uh, was mentioning that actually it decreased of 20% the amount of food that was wasted. So I think that social influence in general, but also adopting a good habit and trying to make other people realize that they should follow this good habit uh, and that, that can generate a domino effect is actually something that, is, that we can do to, to, to tackle the issue, along with, of course, education. And as I said at the beginning, I think the new generations or younger generations in general are very, very, very mindful shopper, if you want. But again, we need to make sure, especially in our industry, as big companies like TripAdvisor, we need to make sure that we address this issue and we are at the forefront of the education side. So explaining to people how they can shop in a more sustainable way. 
Thank you. Um, Mrs. Uh, Epler Wood, you'd like to interject? Just a quick, uh, I think it'll be very consistent with my previous comments. Um, I do believe that, of course, all of the private sector can do their best on this issue. Uh, but then if it's a public-private initiative, there can be biodigesters or other ways to make, I mean, as obviously we don't want to waste food, but if there, there will always be food waste. And that can be used and even become part of, uh, you know, energy strategies for islands such as Cyprus or uh, for, say, creating more. In my community, we do this and it's actually used for the purposes of farming. So either way, it, that becomes a much more holistic way of handling the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Um... So I, I see that uh, our time is uh, running out. And so I would uh, like uh, for me to say thank you so much to all of you uh, for being here. Um, uh, Ms., uh, Mrs. Epler uh, Wood, Megan Epler Wood, president and father of Epler Wood International. Um, and the panelists, Mr. Savas Verdios, uh, deputy minister of tourism, uh, Mrs. Uh, Helen Marano, uh, Mr. Gary Wilson, Mrs. Uh, Angela Guerrero from afar, um, Mr. Fabrizio Orlando, and uh, Mr. Thomas Ellerbeck. Thank you all uh, so much.